Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Fair Housing Training Academy's National Fair Housing Forum entitled Fair Housing Complexities, Preparing Organizations to Handle Systemic Cases. My name is Erin Kempel. I know a lot of you from when I was working at the Connecticut Fair Housing Center. And since I've been doing consulting as a fair housing matter expert, um, I've met even more of you. I am excited to serve as moderator for this month's forum that will provide fair housing organizations and others with a blueprint on how to build a systemic investigation with evidence that will withstand scrutiny. And we'll hear about some of the scrutiny that you can expect to hear when filing a case from the experts who are here today. Before we begin, I want to note that this forum features information and examples that represent the experiences of the speakers Comments do not necessarily reflect the policies of HUD. Before we begin, I'd also like to ha have TJ, our resident tech expert, give us some quick technical tips and instructions. TJ, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Erin. Uh, if any of you do have technical difficulties with audio or video during the webinar, we recommend that you first sign out and then sign back in. And if you're still having trouble after that, you can request help in the Q&A box located on the Zoom panel section at the bottom of your screen. Or you can send an email to NAFTA, that's N-F-H-T-A, at cloudburstgroup.com um, for further assistance. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions. You can enter your questions at any time by selecting the Q&A button on the Zoom panel. Please note that due to time constraints, we may not be able to respond to every question today. The webinar is scheduled for two hours and is being recorded. The recording and the transcript will be made available on the NAFTA website on HUD Exchange, along with resources that will supplement today's conversation. Back to you, Erin. Thank you very much, TJ. Uh, I'd like to start our, our uh, work today by introducing Robert Doles. He is the director of HUD's FHEO Office of Systemic Investigations. I hope it does not come as a surprise to you that uh, HUD actually has an Office of Systemic Investigation. Robert has a background in the administration of federal civil rights programs, including strong skills in com complex investigations, compliance reviews, settlement negotiations, and management. He joined FHEO in 2016 after many years with the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Federal Contract Compliance and Programs. Thank you for being with us today, and I'll turn it over to you, Robert. Thank you, Aaron. It is a pleasure to be here today. Systemic investigations are an extremely important aspect of the work we all do. When conducted properly, systemic investigations can be an effective method to address, among other things, violations of the Fair Housing Act by housing providers and others operating across multiple jurisdictions, impacting numerous individuals and families. Today, you'll hear from a panel of subject matter experts that will discuss best practices to identify systemic complaints and to conduct systemic investigations in an efficient manner. Now, I'd like to stress that the proper allocation of resources and accurate record keeping are critical functions that must be kept in mind. Also, exploring opportunities for collaboration between FIPS and with FAPS and HUD should be considered as well as you go through the process. I hope you find today's forum meaningful, and I truly look forward to continue the dialogue on this issue. We have a lot of information to disseminate. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Aaron, and we can get started. Thank you again, everyone, for joining the forum. Thank you, Robert. I'd like to now introduce Hugh McGlincy. He has been an investigator in the Office of Systemic Investigations at HUD since 2016. Prior to that, Hugh spent 10 years in the Housing Investigations Unit of the New York State Division of Human Rights, an agency which partners with HUD under the FAP program. Hugh will speak to the challenges investigators face during a systemic investigation, as well as best practices to employ. 
Thank you for being with us today, Hugh. I look forward to hearing about the ways that we can investigate systemic cases and ensure that they get a proper hearing as we go forward. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you, Erin, good to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. As you heard, I am Hugh McGlincy, an investigator in the Office of Systemic Investigations. There are a lot of speakers uh, coming up who have a lot of information, which is gonna be very helpful to you. So I'm gonna move through my presentation uh, pretty quickly, if that's okay with you. So uh, buckle up, if you will. Uh, slide, please. It, not the slide, slide. <laughs> Hello? Ah, thank you. Uh, so this past year, the department charged 32 cases as the culmination of an investigation into the activities of company uh, called Homeowners Assistance Services of New York. This was a scam wherein they pretended to be a uh, helping homeowners who were in mortgage distress, but were in fact attempting and to steal a title uh, from their homes. When the charges were announced, Deputy Assistant Principal Secretary, uh, Deputy Assistant, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, my boss too, Demetria McCain made the following powerful uh, statement. Perpetuating, perpetuating a coordinated discriminatory mortgage rescue scam is not only illegal, it is unconscionable. HUD will continue to hold those who prey on homeowners because of the color of their skin or the na nation of their origin accountable for violating the Fair Housing Act. I'm going to talk about these cases as illustrative of some of the challenges that systemic cases can present and some of the tools that you can use to make the case. The audience as FIPS and FAPS will be coming at these cases with somewhat different perspectives, but there's much in common in terms of investigative technique and resources which you can be, bring to bear on these cases. So how did we get here? Slide, please. Thank you. You see a couple of ways of defining uh, systemic cases. Here, the Hasney cases, as they were known, were complex and presented some novel issues and impacted and potentially impacted many homeowners. They involved many respondents, involved lenders and brokers across New York City. And here, this is key, they used very focused and aggressive affinity targeting. Their activities were concentrated in Brooklyn neighborhoods with large populations of persons of Caribbean national origin. They employed staff of similar national origin to contact and convince the homeowners to take their service. The scheme involved telling homeowners they could get them out from under the mortgage by handing over their properties and then getting them back with reduced uh, debt. They rushed the homeowners to sign documents which were transferring title and even provided the attorneys for the homeowners at the closings. They relied on the personal connections and that they had fostered with the homeowners to convince them of what that was happening was fine. Not even necessary to read or understand the documents. An example of how insidious uh, their actions were, they even went to the, the funeral service of a mother of one of the homeowners purporting to be a friend to further ingratiate themselves with that homeowner. Slide, please. Back. Thank you. Um, the story begins with a walk-in uh, at the Brooklyn Legal Services Office. A homeowner comes in and said that they were getting harassed by Hasney, including having their locks uh, changed. The intake unit there recognized this individual was in mortgage uh, distress, and the case went to the mortgage foreclosure unit. They looked up the property records. They looked on the city website. They looked up court records. And most importantly, they also used critical thinking. Knowing the history of discrimination in this country and current discrimination, they viewed the story through the lens of having a race angle and then searched more records and found the respondents as plaintiffs against other homeowners. Because of restraints on lawyers and solicitation of clients, they could not contact the homeowners directly. So they put the word out through a listservs and counseling 
uh, agencies. And, and Amy Nelson, the executive director of, Fair uh, of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, will talk more about resources and how to process uh, uh, these types of systemic cases. Sometimes it'll be readily apparent that their issue is affecting large numbers of people. This may be the case if a FIP or other advocacy group brings the case to a FAP. Other times you may need to see if the single complaint implicates a wider discrimination. So clearly you look up for similar actors, properties, and issues. A and a basic point, but check your case management system to see if these issues or properties or actors have appeared uh, previously. A slide, please. Perhaps a bit obvious, but start developing your theory of the case at the beginning as you listen and learn more facts. Also, an eye plan is essential uh, because of the complexity of these cases and the number of players who may be involved. And of course, as you continue uh, to do the case, evolve the eye plan as you gather evidence and do additional analysis. Here you see the Hasney theory and the elements uh, uh, of the case. Uh, slide, please. Brooklyn Legal Services brought the case with the theory of discrimination, and they also did some mapping, which was a big help. They used the New Economy uh, Project uh, for their mapping, and that's a good resource to keep in mind as, as you do uh, some of your work. Um, our office needed to do independent mapping and analysis, and you see one of the maps which we uh, created. One of the challenges addressed uh, by Dr. Scott Susson, who was in our office at the time and whom, with whom you will hear from later, uh, was the respondent position on discriminatory targeting. So their argument and their offense is that they were fishing where the fish were, in essence, that the homeowners who were in distress lived in those neighborhoods, and that's why they were active there. And here, with the map and the uh, figures that we uh, found, you can see that apparent that they were targeting was focused on Caribbean neighborhoods. And, and one of the challenges was several ways we had to analyze and define what was the Caribbean neighborhood. And, and we looked at a couple of different um, ways to define eventually settling on one. And you can see they were not just operating where there were foreclosure rates, but were disproportionately acting in, in Caribbean neighborhoods. Also, 29 out of the 34 or 85% of the victims we contacted uh, by, uh, uh, during the course of the investigation were Black or Afro-Caribbean. Slide, please. Oh, you may be most familiar with mapping as an analytical uh, tool in redlining cases, but there are many other cases uh, where the mapping can uh, demonstrate discriminatory impact or discriminatory treatment. For example, looking at eviction or tenant screening cases, here on the left, you have the percentage of black and Hispanic residents, and, and on the right, the number of evictions, uh, and you can see the strong correlation. Um, at the top, you have some resources. I would just mention that the FFEIC geocoding system, uh, you can, with relative ease, look up one address at a time, and it's free, that's good. Uh, and I would also note if you're using vendors, ask for the uh, not-for-profit rate. Um, OSI's geographer, Dr. Tricia Ruiz, uh, suggests reaching out to subject matter experts uh, for demographic and geospatial analysis. And, and you can often contact local universities through the academics. I find are very anxious to talk about their work and, and want to get involved. And they have students and interns who want projects, and, and so that's a good uh, resource. Uh, slide, please. So this is pretty straightforward, as you see uh, some of the challenges that systemic uh, cases may pose, the number of moving pieces and the resource and volu voluminous evidence. As Director Dole says, it's important to keep the records and keep organized. I would only say, you know, you may uh, encounter uh, many respondents who have high-powered uh, counsel, aggressive counsel, don't be deterred by that. Uh, that's a challenge, rise to that challenge. And remember, you are on the right side. Uh, so you've got that. I would also just uh, note that if you can identify where possible, seek to identify individual uh, complainants uh, as well as look at it broadly, uh, that's also uh, helpful. Um, we've talked about the importance of an investigative plan to stay organized. 
um, use the investigative skills uh, that you have, uh, adjust a plus, um, the importance of a team on the Hasney cases. I worked with Karen Delancey for much of the investigation and then was joined by Danielle Sievers. And then under Director Doles, uh, we charged uh, the case. Um, the cases are different uh, than a single uh, complainant with a single allegation of discrimination. But some of what you do is in fact going to be using a solid basic investigative technique and not dissimilar from what you approach a single complainant with a single issue. There will be more complex requiring more sophisticated tools, but the best approach to systemic investigation is to marry the two techniques, uh, the two approaches. Uh, slide please. Ah, so on, uh, on conciliation, uh, as, I, as I wrap up, um, I would say just make sure that your, your public interest is robust and broad, but it's also targeted to address the specific harm in those who have been harmed or will be harmed. So if it's race-based, be wary of settlements that target areas of lower moderate income and may, uh, or census tracts, right? That may miss actually the people who have been harmed, right? maybe too broad. And, and note, finally, if you have individual complainants, keep them involved in the conciliation a process, listen to them, get their input, keep them informed, because otherwise, at the end of the day, you may have an agreement with the respondents with robust public interest relief and some relief for a complainant, and the complainant doesn't want to sign, doesn't want to conciliate. So uh, uh, keep them I I involved. And... Um, Slide, please. Thank you for your attention. We a lot to say on systemic, but I tried to hit a couple of important notes. Thank you, Hugh. I think you heard a couple of themes that will be coming up over and over again today. One of them is uh, there are there will be, I hope, more um, information giving uh, you some examples of of. Uh, resources you can use, and also the information with regards to ensuring that you have an investigative plan in place and are able to implement that. I'd like to now turn it over to Ayelet Weiss. She is the Assistant General Counsel for Fair Housing Enforcement at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Ayala joined HUD through the Legal Honors Program in 2013, subsequently serving as a trial attorney and the Deputy Assistant General Counsel for Fair Housing Compliance before, being, before assuming her current role in 2023. Her work at HUD spans several areas of civil rights law, including matters related to environmental justice, discriminatory local ordinances, and fair lending. Ayala will help us better understand HUD's role relative to, uh, excuse me, systemic cases, how best to present evidence to HUD when bringing a systemic case and more. Ayala, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, as Erin said, my name is Ayelet Weiss. I am the Assistant General Counsel for Fair Housing Enforcement here at HUD. And I am going to talk a bit about counsel's perspective and what we look for when giving legal advice about or reviewing a systemic case. I'm going to start by talking about which issues might be a good fit for a systemic investigation. Then I'm going to talk about how to right size and focus your investigation. And last, I'll talk about how to pick the best legal framework for your case and how to frame your evidence. All right, let's dig in. Often people think of systemic investigations as lending cases, or they think of systemic investigations as necessarily being very data heavy. But I want to highlight that there are a lot of topics that can be a good fit for a systemic investigation. For example, a big developer building inaccessible properties or a local ordinance that singles out folks based on their national origin or a neighborhood that bans affordable housing for racist reasons. A systemic case will often be a good idea, first of all, when a lot of people are affected and second, when the harms were extreme or are continuing to occur. And that can cover a lot of types of cases. 
some involving tons of data, and some that rely more heavily on other forms of evidence. There are a lot of problems out there in the world, but as you'll often hear me say, not all of them are Fair Housing Act problems. So I'm going to talk a bit now about how to focus your investigation to really hone in on the aspect of the problem that is a violation of the law. It's one thing to look around and see a problem that's harming a particular protected class group, but it's another thing to take the next step and identify the cause of that problem. Take, for example, the problem of segregation. You see an area where segregation is getting worse. That's a bad problem, sure, and that can be where you start your investigation. But that's not enough to know if there's a violation of the law, let alone what that violation might be. Next, you'd have to ask, why is segregation getting worse in this area? Has something changed recently? Is there perhaps a new local law that's driving that trend? Many problems will have multiple causes, and if so, try to identify the one or two driving causes and focus on those. You might even have to drill down to a root cause. For example, if A is caused by B, which in turn is caused by C, which in turn is caused by D, et cetera. Getting to the root driving cause is essential to making out a tight Fair Housing Act case. Once you've identified that root driving cause of your problem, ask yourself who is responsible for that cause and what would you have had them do differently? If you can't point to a person or an entity responsible and say what they should have done instead, it's kind of hard to say that they broke the law. Here you'll see that I've mapped out an example of an observable problem, the lack of affordable housing in certain areas, along with six potential causes. Depending on your facts, each of these causes might or might not be a Fair Housing Act violation. Note that not all of these potential causes will be present in every fact pattern. It's so context specific, which is why it is essential that you tease out what the specific cause of the problem is in your individual case. Here you'll see that I've mapped out another example of an observable problem, a housing development that is conspicuously lacking people from certain groups. That is not actually in itself a Fair Housing Act violation. That is just a problem you observe. Next, you have to ask why. How did that happen? What caused that problem and who was responsible for that cause? Again, you'll see six possible causes and depending on your facts, each of these causes might or might not be a Fair Housing Act violation. Again, it comes down to why is this thing happening and who is responsible for that why. So you've seen a problem, you've identified its cause and the entity responsible. You investigate and you're ready to bring your case. How do you frame your evidence? The Fair Housing Act has a lot of methods of proof that can get kind of legalistic and technical. I find that often it's easy to get bogged down in those technicalities and overwhelmed by them which is why I always tell people to start by thinking about the story that your evidence tells. The surest way to know whether you're using the right legal theory is to start by knowing your story, what precisely feels wrong about the situation, and only then looking to what framework will help you tell that story. The same is true for picking your data and your maps. Don't just dump every statistic you have in there. Ask yourself, what was wrong about what happened and what data will help me illustrate just what makes it wrong? Often people think only of disparate impact when they think of systemic investigations. But I've found that most cases that seem like disparate impact cases at first, in fact, have some discriminatory intent evidence hiding somewhere. So I would strongly encourage you always to probe for that. For example, were statements made using racially coded language? If you're dealing with a case involving a decision by a group, such as a local government or a homeowners association, 
I'd suggest looking towards the Arlington Heights framework, which is a great tool for using disparate impact evidence to prove discriminatory intent as one factor among many. Sometimes people use the phrase disparate impact as shorthand when they really mean the framework of an unjustified discriminatory effect. If you truly do not have intent evidence, that's the legal framework you will be using to prove your case. Under HUD's discriminatory effects rule, there are actually two types of evidence that you can use under this framework, evidence of disparate impact or evidence of perpetuation of segregation. Figuring out which one of these best fits your facts will come back again to knowing what story you're trying to tell with your evidence and matching a framework to that story. If you're using the discriminatory effects framework, whether with evidence of disparate impact or evidence of perpetuation of segregation, don't forget about the last two steps under that framework. Is the practice necessary to achieve a substantial legitimate justification? And even if so, is there a less discriminatory alternative? These two steps together make up the unjustified part of the unjustified discriminatory effects standard. These two steps are both legally and conceptually very important because it is not necessarily unlawful to take actions that disproportionately harm certain groups. What makes those actions unlawful is if you do it for no good reason. So to conclude, think broadly about what make a good systemic case. The best ones will start with a problem that harms a lot of people in an extreme or ongoing way. Focus your investigation by pinning down the driving root cause of that problem and identifying the entity responsible for that cause and what they should have done instead. Use that to build the story of your case and use that story to figure out what evidence and what frameworks will help you tell it. Thank you. Thank you, Ayelet. I appreciate um, the remarks that we've just heard from Robert, Ayelet, and Hugh. Uh, for the information that they have given us regarding HUD's expectations and experiences regarding evidence and investigations at systemic cases. On the screen and also on the NAFTA website, you should be able to see the learning objectives for today's uh, training. Those learning objectives include learning how to build systemic investigations, including how to recognize systemic violations, getting advice on how to train staff to ensure that systemic investigations are documented and evidence is preserved for presentation in court or in an administrative forum. You'll receive advice on how to decide which people and organizations should be part of bringing a complaint, including issues that can arise when involving injured parties in other jurisdictions, Understand how to investigate ownership and management of a property, identify factors to, and identify factors to consider when deciding where to file a complaint. Finally, before I introduce our esteemed panelists today, I want to provide a few reminders. Throughout today's discussion, you will have a chance to submit questions that we will do our best to answer later. However, note that we will not all questions will be able to be answered and personal questions will not be addressed. You may submit questions at any time viewing via the Q and A box. And I'll ask some a few free flowing questions of each panelist and then open it up to other panelists for additional comments. As a reminder, we are also recording this event. The slide deck is already available on the forum paid on HUD Exchange. And the link to that has been included in the Q&A chat. This information and the materials used in today's forum, including the event recording, will be available on HUD Exchange soon after the event. Now, I'd like to begin by introducing Amy Nelson, who, as you have already heard, is the Executive Director of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana. She will be joined by Scott Chang, the Senior Civil Rights Counsel at the National Fair Housing Alliance, and Scott Susan, Senior Economist at the Federal Housing Finance Agency. 
I'm going to hand it over to Amy, who will discuss how to create a work culture that looks at cases systemically. She joined the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana in October of 2011 as their founding executive director. She upholds the mission of the FHCCI to ensure housing opportunities by eliminating housing discrimination through advocacy, enforcement, education, and outreach. We're very happy to have you here with us today, Amy, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Erin, and thank you to NAFTA for hosting this webinar. I've got a lot of material that I also have to cover in a very um, short amount of time, so let me go ahead and get started. I want to say that, first of all, the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, as Erin mentioned, we're actually a newer organization. We actually got up and running in January of 2012, and we have a typical FIP-oriented type mission. Uh, we were started up under an original HUD or new organizations grant, so thank you HUD. And for 10 of our now 12 years, we were only a staff of five, five full-time employees plus our testers. And it's only been the last two years that we've been able to expand our staff up to nine. And I wanna point that out to you because we're a fairly typical fair housing organization in that five to eight kind of range that exclusively works on fair housing. We don't have a housing counseling program. We don't do landlord tenant. We're exclusively a fair housing organization in so, so many ways, very typical of other HUD FIP organizations across the country. And we wanted to do systemic based cases. And I was asked today to kind of drill down to more of the basics for those who may not do systemic based investigations or maybe new staff that have been hired and just don't know where to start. So I'm gonna start with some of those basics and I am not an attorney. And our organization has been able to build some systemic investigations um, despite that. And we go and find attorneys when we need that support. So first of all, what are systemic investigations? Both Hugh and I led both gave some examples of what can be some more complex forms of systemic investigations. But I wanna point out that it's also our bread and butter type cases. So traditional rental cases, but where you expand to look property or ownership wide, rather than just that individual intake that may have come into your office involving one single property, one single allegation or complaint. But you then have the potential of expanding it to be able to sometimes um, address hundreds or thousands of rental units. And then it can be those more complex cases that we have done as well with mortgage lending or insurance, where again, you are challenging systemic wide practices and maybe you don't receive complaints in this area. People can't identify that they have been discriminated against. So you're out randomly investigating the market to try to uncover those type of issues and get those discriminatory practices stopped. In looking at these, and these, are, these bullets here are all examples of systemic investigations that my organization has worked under. A client contacts us about a design construction allegation involving the single property that that client is at, but we expand it to look and investigate other properties by that developer and that owner. Or you're investigating a company in your area for um, overly restrictive occupancy um, standards that are impacting families with children, and you contact fellow fair housing organizations because they have property by that owner or that management company in their area. Your city or county, like so many across the nation, has a wide home ownership gap when it comes to who can become a homeowner between whites and people of color. And you wanna know, is mortgage lending and what banks are doing playing a role in that? A social service agency comes to you and says, we can't get our clients housed um, that have been recently incarcerated. Or you see a news story about a biracial couple who has experienced appraisal bias, and you open up a systemic investigation to try to determine, is that happening in your area as well? So those are some of those examples. I will point out that our organization also has systemic investigations that we have put in place that are more broad-based, topical, 
we put that in place and we track our time until we identify specific housing providers, specific insurance carriers, specific companies, because we're tracking that time because we might be able to get those costs back as part of that broader systemic investigation. On my slide here are just some examples of some of these broader investigations that we have. Things like looking at evictions from a race, color, or gender-based role to see if that has an impact. Reverse mortgages, source of income discrimination, do people of color or those with children or those with disabilities treated differently? We buy homes for cash that target typically vulnerable homeowners, um, typically homeowners of color, sometimes due to their age as well, if that is protected in your area. Environmental justice, which is certainly um, something that HUD is looking at. Appraisals, we have filed some complaints in this area and have some broad investigations we opened up. When we initially saw that New York Times story, we started an appraisal investigation, even though we did not have specific appraisers yet at that time identified. Tenant screening, criminal history, lending, the list goes on. And these are all broader, again, topical investigations where we open up an investigation. And then from there, we may narrow that down, open up new investigations that identify targeted housing providers, banks, insurers, etc. And this is good for diversion of resource, which we're going to talk about here in just a moment. So taking that first steps, and again, this might be really basic for some of you, but I wanted to make sure that we're also talking to those who just don't aren't able to do this work or just don't know where to start. For us, every intake that comes into our office, we database, we have a database, a, a system that was created by the Miami Valley Fair Housing Center that we have adapted over the years. A number of you have this system as well as some other systems for tracking those intakes. Um, so when we are either doing a client-based systemic investigation or a more broader topical investigation, it all starts with an intake. How did that issue come to us? Was it somebody contacting us? Was it us seeing a news story or becoming aware of something? And all that gets documented because that's going to be important because you will get asked about that later. So for example, we have an investigation here where this is an actual um, systemic investigation where we saw a news story where a property management CEO was complaining um, about families with children where he wanted to target older adults because he felt it was costing too much to put playground equipment into their properties. No individual had contacted us about this. This was something the staff saw. And we created an intake to track this investigation. Uh, this is not the actual one, obviously, um, for uh, confidentiality reasons. And we attached that news story, assigned an investigation. And that's important because in every deposition, you will get asked, how did, this, how did you become aware of this issue? And you want that to be well documented with that initial start of that intake. And then this number you're going to see is going to track throughout our investigation for tracking our time. So what do we do here? We also then open up an investigation. All of you might have different methods, not saying that ours is the way to do it. It's just a system that works for us where we go through and we assign a, assign a number to that intake for that investigation. And we do not open up an investigation on every single intake that comes to our office. We have to do some work past the intake to warrant an investigation. And we sign that number. So good way for us by tracking it by year, by um, the number of investigations opened up during that calendar year, and then that intake number that then follows. So this would then be the investigative number that is used that's attached to the digital file where all the materials the staff download, create, anything like that is put into that digital computer folder for discovery purposes later. So something isn't missing or gets lost uh, as well within that. And so as staff then are working this particular investigation, whether one those topical or more specific, then they are entering their time and they're tagging that intake number so that it is tracking and it's capturing all that time in an organized way. So for example, here, this entry for me might have talked about drafting a HUD complaint and I tag that intake number 
And that is going to follow us then throughout the investigation. Our database, again, many of us have systems like this. If you do not have any sort of database um, tracking system, please uh, evaluate the sources that are out there. Some are extremely affordable and some are very costly, but some are very affordable to be able to use. And our database helps us not only in being able to adequately show our diversion of resources and to track things, but it also is good for our grant management and being able to show HUD that we are good stewards of HUD funds and what specifically we are doing as well. So our system allows a variety of different searches that we can do, whether it's for grant management or for case management as well. As part of this, at any time then, I can go by that intake number that has been set up. I can go and pull that up and see all of the staff time that has been entered related to that intake. This again is a fake example that I set up. This would have had all staff, not just me as it does right here. It would have all staff that have been entering their time, tagging that intake number, our expenses, um, our out-of-pocket expenses that we might have accrued during that time. And this really helps us again for uh, discovery, for our diversion of resources, as well as helps us to kind of have to tell the story of what we did throughout this investigation. So why is all of this important? Well, if you want to get your costs back, if you want to win your case that you are filing, you're gonna to have to show diversion of resources. And being able to show that methodology, how that strong methodology you have for your time tracking system and your out-of-pocket costs is going to be significant in being able to prove that diversion. It will help you. It's gonna help you in being able to not forget or have things um, in different spots. This is all in one organized system that all staff have access to. And again, like I mentioned, it helps in telling your story when you're being deposed. Those time, that time management system is really the story of your work that then you can walk through, refresh your memory, because sometimes it might be a year, two years later that you are having to explain this and you're not gonna remember this investigation from another. And Scott will talk later about more diversion of resources issues. Diversion, more diversion of resource, frustration of mission, <laughs> that database um, tracking system also allows you to be able to show how you tried to counteract or combat the discrimination that you might have had covered. Maybe, for instance, you did a social media campaign like this example, or you conducted a training. You conducted a mailing to the property. Those are examples then because it can help you later. And again, this is in your timesheets. It's being coded there. It's going to all show up when you are having to talk about and prove what you did. You might have had a social media or PSA campaign, conducted a targeted mailing to individuals living at that property, conducted specific types of trainings, had a video or a billboard campaign to try to get the word out or find other victims. You issued a report to the community, for instance. And Scott will talk more about some frustration and mission claims as well. <clears throat> Next, conducting some more complex or technical investigations. As I mentioned, Hugh talked about one of those. So not only can it be that design construction case over multiple properties, that occupancy restriction, Tenant screening, I would say, is a more complex type of investigation because of the data that's needed in a disparate impact case. For lending, when we started out doing lending work, we didn't know what to do. What we knew was that there was a home ownership gap in our community between whites and people of color. We were seeing that homes of color were being devalued. Um, people did not have access to FHA products or products that FHA type products that were usable that could compete. We were seeing bank branches closing all across our neighborhoods, most often in neighborhoods of color first. And then we were seeing high interest rates or other types of fees um, being added into products. But we did not have specific lenders identified. We just knew this was a problem. So we started a broad-based topical lending investigation. And from that then, we gathered data and we actually issued a report, but um, prior to that, prior to the report we released more recently, we were gathering data. <clears throat> Since about 2015, we've been working in um, on lending investigations. 
And we wanted to find out who were the bigger lend mortgage lenders in our community. We had no idea when we started. So we went, got data, and started putting that list together to just educate ourselves um, about these issues. And then from there then, so that was all in our broad-based topical lending investigation. That's gathering all that information just in case we can get those costs later. But then from there, we then opened up targeted specific lending investigations involving specific lenders based upon data or testing that we might have done off of those initial um, larger lenders that we had identified. <clears throat> so an example from a very public report we released identifying where um, lenders or uh, mortgage lenders were far below what their peers were doing on applications. And any of these, for example, could have been targeted systemic investigations that we opened up involving only that lender. And we rarely get complaints from the community about lending-based discrimination. And we have moved forward, filed specific actions, resolved cases off of purely our systemic work without a single individual contacting us. And I'm gonna finish up my slides talking about that. <clears throat> so once you get started, what might make things easier as you kind of get into this, particularly disparate impact cases where you want access to data or lending cases, um, et cetera, is that there are some services where you can purchase data to make it easier for you. If you do not have a full-time data person on your staff, um, there are some services, if you can build those into your budgets, things like lending patterns, CoStar, Adam, um, Hugh already talked about, Esri, Stata, number of those type of services are out there. Some of them can get very expensive. So be aware of that while others are more affordable. But there's also free data or very low cost data that's out there that you can use in your systemic investigations, whether that's census, HEMDA, property records, um, court records that you can typically get free or at a very minimal cost in bulk from your courts uh, related to that. So that information is out there that can also help you get started. Then um, in my last slides, I want to talk about the impact of fair housing organization partnerships. We have been very fortunate um, to be in a part of the country where we have fair housing groups in the states around us. We might be the only fair housing group in Indiana, but we have states around us with other fair housing groups. And then we have also at different times reached out to fair housing groups in other parts of the country because we found that there was um, a property that was located there that was owned or managed by a particular investigation that we had. So that's where your work can become part of a broader systemic investigation. That single property that you might be investigating in your area may be able to be expanded to have a broader impact. Very often housing providers own property or doing business in other states. We are seeing a consolidation in housing. Companies are buying up more. I worry about the long-term impact of that, but more and more of that is getting bought up. But that opens the door for us to have some partnerships with other fair housing organizations to have a bigger impact. When we um, are looking at moving forward in enforcement action, we will, or as part when we're doing investigation, we will look up where they have property, where that lender is also very active and reach out to those fair housing organizations to ask them if they've been investigating this particular company. Are they willing to do some testing if they have not? Are they willing to partner if they find violations of law? Um, and, and as part of that, we've been very fortunate to have some successes where we've been invited into investigations or have launched our own. On our advocacy page on our website, we um, try to be very transparent and list most of our major investigations, our smaller cases we don't put up there, but most of our major ones are there where you could go and take a look at that if you're interested uh, on getting started. And these are some of the examples of some of those partnerships that we have had, some very broad-based examples. But I wanna talk some very specifics in my last couple slides. And that is some of our cases that we have closed, where we've been able to have a much bigger impact by joining with other fair housing organizations. 
We had a tenant screening case, for instance, a few years ago that we wrapped up involving um, some other fair housing organizations. And because of that, we were able to impact 27 complexes and over 5,700 units, far more than just our Indiana-based companies. We just a few months ago wrapped up an ASL investigation where by partnering with the group in Grand Rapids, we were able to impact over 11,000 multifamily units. We have had several familial status occupancy restriction cases that we have been invited in or have partnered with our fellow fair housing organizations across the country in doing that type of work. And because of that, we have been able to impact far more properties had we kept it to just the Indiana properties. We have also had some design and construction cases that we have worked, again, partnering with fair housing groups, HOPE, NAFA, um, the, housing, uh, the Housing Research and Advocacy, Home of Buffalo, others to have Clover case, 10 other fair housing organizations partnered together on that, impacting 50 properties in 60 states. NAFA, the National Fair Housing Alliance, has been doing REO investigations and pulling in fair housing organizations as part of that. And then we've had our systemic cases where we have had a large impact because of that systemic based work where again, we did not have people calling us complain about these lenders, but yet we were able to investigate and then have enforcement actions resolve where we were able to impact the creation of bank branches, them having to set aside money for affordable housing, grants to area nonprofits that we negotiated or um, recommended. And then of course, our costs being reimbursed and our attorney's fees as well. And we've also had our appraisal and rent to own cases. So with that, um, I'll be available for questions later. The Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana is here. Happy to work as, um, uh, be here as a resource if there's anything that we can help with. And hopefully um, we'll find more ways to work together to truly stop the harms of housing discrimination across our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. One quick question before you go, if you could come back on camera. Um, <clears throat> Can you just give um, some examples of how you communicate with complainants about your process when you either do open a systemic or you do not open a systemic? I don't want to cut down on Scott Chang's time, but if you could just give that a quick answer, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, when we have a client-based investigation, so somebody's come to us with something, we, we keep that client informed throughout about their individual complaint and what we found. But we will at times, particularly if there is um, any sort of statute of, uh, you know, any sort of deadline that might be approaching, we don't want to endanger their complaints. We're going to keep them updated of, hey, we're going to reach out to these other fair housing groups. We're going to try to pull this in. We're going to try to do a broader investigation. But at the end of the day, we're going to make sure that you're protected and that your, uh, your case, your individual case isn't forgotten and nothing else, we're going to get that case filed and then look at this broader investigation as part of it. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. I'm going to move on to um, Scott Chang, who is our next panelist. He will share issues to consider when deciding where to file systemic cases and circumstances investigating ownership and management. Scott is a senior counsel at the National Fair Housing Alliance. Before joining NAFA, he was the litigation director at the Housing Rights Center in Los Angeles. He has been counsel at Roman Dane and Colfax, an attorney at Brandcart and Brandcart, and a sole practitioner. Glad to have you with us, Scott, and go ahead. Thanks so much, Aaron, um, and thanks so much for having me. Um, I wanted to address a couple of issues from the perspective of an attorney litigating uh, systemic cases. First, I wanted to talk about some of the factors that I think about when a systemic case comes through the door from an organization. Second, I wanted to talk about some trends in organizational standing and how to document injury for an organization. Third, I wanted to talk about some considerations in naming a defendant or respondent. And then I was going to finish up by talking about where to file systemic cases and what considerations you should think about in filing a systemic case. Um, so I am from the National Fair Housing Alliance, uh, which is a national organization that works 
to eliminate housing discrimination, ensure equitable housing opportunities for all people and communities through a number of different programs, um, including enforcement. And our enforcement program is focused on um, developing uh, and litigating systemic cases. Um, so here are some of the factors that I always consider when assessing a case from a fair housing organization, whether as um, in-house counsel for a fair housing organization or outside counsel. Um, so first, I, I look at whether or not there's a policy or practice, and if there is a policy or practice, then it's more likely to be a systemic case. Um, as Hugh mentioned, um, I think about whether or not there are other people harmed by the alleged discrimination. And I think, as Hugh also said, it's really helpful to include individuals who have been harmed in a systemic case that's also being brought being brought by the organization. I also think about, are there other people who have been affected by the discrimination that um, we haven't been in contact? And if we haven't been in contact with them, I try to set up interviews with them. I look at the geographic scope of the alleged discrimination. Um, is it limited to a specific neighborhood or city, or does it impact several different cities? Um, I look at the type of discrimination, uh, the method of proof, um, disparate impact, disparate treatment, or reasonable accommodations or modifications. Any of those types of cases can be systemic cases, and maybe there might slightly be more um, systemic cases with disparate impact. Um, whether or not there should be some additional testing or investigation that needs to be done to determine the scope of the violation or to fill in any holes in evidence. Um, I think about injunctive relief, if there are only individual potential plaintiffs involved, um, if they, and I, I think about whether or not they're still affected by the discrimination, and if not, then it may be helpful to um, try to involve a fair housing organization to obtain more broader relief. And then also think about whether or not there is a need for other fair housing organizations to be involved. As Amy mentioned, um, you might wanna get uh, other fair housing organizations in different cities involved if the discrimination is systemic and has um, broader geographic scope. So I wanted to uh, start by talking about some trends in organizational standing. Um, from the last last year or so. Um, so as all of you uh, probably recognize, um, organizations are critical to bringing systemic discrimination cases because they can take on broader discrimination and segregation in our neighborhoods and can obtain broader injunctive relief. Um, organizational standing or the ability of organizations to bring uh, cases has been an important consideration for years, but there have been two trends in recent years on organizational standing in the courts. And the first is that the courts are looking more rigorously at organizational standing. And second, um, there is a trend um, towards the courts requiring some showing of harm to the mission of the organization. Um, so th that's kind of a, a more recent development in organizational standing. Um, and I just wanted to note, this is a map of the different uh, circuit courts of appeals. Um, and each of these different circuits has different rules on standing. Um, so they can vary from circuit to circuit, um, depending on which court that you're in. Um, and wanted to just give a couple of examples of um, cases that reflect the trend uh, towards uh, showing some injury to the mission of the organization. The first is Louisiana Fair Housing Action Center versus Zelia Garden. This is a criminal background screening case brought by a fair housing organization challenging a blanket ban prohibiting tenants from having a criminal background. This is a pretty significant case that imposed a higher burden in organizational standing cases um, that you need to show um, harm to the organization. Um, and so it could be either discrimination, the discrimination itself harms the organization, or it could be that there needs to be a diversion of resources which are harms or injures the organization's mission or its programs. This is a pretty significant change in how to prove organizational standing. 
Um, right now, it only impacts courts in the Fifth Circuit, which is Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, but it could be influential um, in other uh, federal courts. And the last thing I want to mention about Azalea Garden is it's unclear whether or not Azalea Garden uh, will affect how HUD or DOJ deal with organizational standing. Um, and then there's a second case here, Southwest for Housing Councils versus W.G. Scottsdale, which is another case um, where there was some discussion of injury to the mission of the organization. This is a case that involved testing by a fair housing organization of an assisted living complex for a more American Sign Language interpretation. Um, and it was a, the Southwest for Housing Council won at trial. Um, and defendants appealed. Um, and this act, this case is actually a win for plaintiffs, both on standing and on the merits. But there is a concurrence from one of the judges um, that holds that there should be a more rigorous um, standard for standing in the Ninth Circuit that requires a diversion of resources to avert harm to the organization's mission. Um, at this point, that case doesn't change the law uh, on standing, organizational standing in the Ninth Circuit, and it's unclear whether or not that concurrence from that judge will have an impact on how standing in the Ninth Circuit is viewed in the future. Um, so just wanted uh, to highlight there this, this new trend in standing cases. Again, this is the map of the different circuits. And as you can see at the bottom um, in the Fifth Circuit, that's where the Azalea Garden case came out of. So it affects Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And then the Southwest for Housing case came out of the Ninth Circuit. And it affects Western states, including California, Oregon, and Washington, and other, other Western states. So, um, the circuits have um, different standards on organizational standing, but there's a, basically three different elements. Um, so there could be um, a diversion to other programs or activities is one. Second is diversion away from other programs or activities. And then some, the last one is some showing of frustration of mission. For diversion to an investigation or to other programs or activities, um, there is a question about whether an investigation or testing is sufficient. Um, and then sometimes um, you can establish standing or oftentimes you can establish showing standing by showing that the Fair Housing Organization had to counteract the discrimination through education and outreach counseling or other activities. And those are the, some of the things that Amy mentioned in her presentation. Um, one of the second um, possible element is diversion away from other activities or programs. Um, and this might be important to show harm to the mission. Um, and um, you might want to think about whether or not um, the time you spent um, counteracting or investigating case could have spent been spent on other core activities, such as fundraising, strategic planning, or operations. And then for frustration mission, it's not really clear um, what is sufficient to establish frustration of mission in the various circuits. Um, at a minimum, it requires that, that organizations have a mission to address housing discrimination. And whether or not you have to show um, all three elements and the standard for proving the requirements differ from each circuit to circuit. So I wanted to spend a second um, talking about documenting diversion of resources. Amy gave some great examples in her uh, presentation. Um, it's good to uh, record that time contemporaneously or as you are doing it, like Amy's, um, like Amy said, um, and record your time in tenth of an hour is probably preferable or quarter of an hour, and then just have a short description of what was done. And I think Amy gave some great examples of, of that and why diverse, documenting diversion resources is so important. In terms of documenting diversion of resources um, from other programs or activities, again, this may be something that's really important to show the harm uh, to the mission. Um, and you may uh, be able to find some of the things that you were diverted 
from through your strategic plans, operations plans, or action plans. Um, and you may want to look at it both um, looking at it both by the staff that was involved in the efforts to counteract or investigation and also on an organization wide basis. And then in terms of frustration of mission, I think it's good to make sure that your mission state statement is accurate, that accurately reflects the scope of your mission, and then um, just unclear as to how these other bullet points will be imposed by the courts or if they will, will be imposed. Um, but you might wanna think about how, how your mission was harmed by the defendants or respondents conduct and explain how the diversion of resources might have harmed your mission. Again, it's not clear how uh, or, or if those second two bullet points will be adopted by the courts. So I wanted to turn to um, just some thoughts on naming defendants or respondents um, under the Fair Housing Act. Anyone who commits a discriminatory housing practice um, can be liable. Um, vicarious liability applies in fair housing cases. Vicarious liability are legal rules that hold a person or company liable for the actions of their agents or employees. Um, and then just included here, uh, the definition of agent from the HUD regulations, which is a pretty broad definition. Um, so any person harm authorized to perform an action on behalf of another person regarding any matter related to the sale or rental of dwellings could be an, an agent. In terms of practical um, considerations, um, it's often makes sense to name as defendants or respondents all persons or entities responsible for the violations, unless there's a strategic reason not to. Um, testing can be really useful in terms of identifying defendants or respondents or who had a role in this discriminatory practice. Um, in terms of just identifying the specific defendants or respondents, Secretary of Web uh, State and Assessor websites can be very helpful. And then just wanted to note um, that even if you make a mistake, um, you can often uh, amend to name the correct defendant or respondent or to add additional um, defendants or respondents if you learn um, after the case is filed that there are additional uh, persons or entities that are responsible for discrimination. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about um, is just where to file. And there's a couple of options. So there's HUD, um, there's a state FAP, there's federal court, and there's state court. Um, and also um, Department of Justice, I put that in parentheses because Department of Justice has um, pattern or practice authority so that if you bring a case to the Department of Justice, um, they may choose to litigate it um, under if there is a pattern or practice, but it's discretionary on um, Department of Justice's uh, part to determine whether or not they will actually file. And some things to think about when thinking about um, whether to file um, standing, um, the substantive law, the jury pool, and the trial and appellate judges. So given the shifting uh, rules on organizational standing, state courts might be a forum to consider. Um, and depending on you know, what, um, how HUD and FAPS and DOJs um, decide uh, whether or not Azalea Garden affects their rules on standing, those also might be good forums um, to consider. Um, and then you also might wanna think about the substantive law, whether or not, there are good interpretations of fair housing law um, in that particular um, federal court or at HUD or FAP. I mean, HUD and FAP tend to have more subject matter expertise. Um, and if so, if there's a particular legal issue that will be important in your case and you have a choice about where to file, um, you might want to think about um, interpretations or how different forums interpret uh, the law that might be applied to your case. Um, if you're filing in court, um, the jury pool is something to consider. Some courts have more uh, favorable jury pools. And then also think about um, whether the trial or appellate judges, um, there are some judges that are better on civil rights and for housing cases than others. Um, and 
Uh, so that might be something that you want to think about in determining where to file. And finally, I just wanted to, uh, to um, show this slide, which illustrates where you can file in federal court. So where any defendant resides, where the claims arose or the property is located or any district where any defendant is subject to personal jurisdiction or essentially that usually means whether or not they are doing business in a particular um, jurisdiction. So with a larger uh, company or with some governmental entities, you likely to have a choice on uh, where you can file. Um, and so I will wrap up uh, now. So thank you very much again for having me um, and I'll be available later on to answer questions. Before, excuse me, thank you very much, Scott. That was great. Um, before you go, <clears throat> we had a question in the chat a little earlier about how, what you should think about with regards to systemic, with regards to the statute of limitations in systemic cases. Do they all have to have the same statute of limitations? Um, do they uh, have different statutes of limitation depending upon what what do you think about? I shouldn't keep yeah, that's suggesting a, it. That's just a like... great. That's a great question, Aaron. Um, so, uh, so generally under the Fair Housing Act, if you're filing in court, it's a two year statute of limitations, and if you're filing with an administrative agency like HUD, it's one year. Um, some of the, some FAPs have have different uh, a different uh, statute of limitations, um, and then if you're looking at a systemic case, uh, you want to look at um, when was the last time that a particular uh, discriminatory practice or policy was uh, applied um, and and start the statute of limitations from that point? There are, are different ways in which you could extend the statute of limitations, but I think I'll just finish finish my answer there. And um, if there are other questions, happy to answer those. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We are running ahead of time, which I don't think I've ever been on a seminar where that's happened. Um, uh, so we will have a chance to answer more questions at the end. But right now, I'd like to turn it over to Scott Snesson. He is uh, going to provide us with an overview of the statistical analysis that can be used in systemic fair housing investigations. Scott is a senior economist at the Federal Housing Finance Agency's Office of Fair Lending Oversight, where he focuses on the regulation of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, including analyses of disparities in mortgage interest rates and home appraisals. Thank you for being with us, Scott, and I turn it over to you. Thanks. Um, one thing you left off the introduction is that both, I'm at FHFA now, but before that I was at HUD in the Office of Systemic Investigations for many years. So shout out to those to you guys. Thank um, you. That's helpful to know. Yeah, but I want to talk about the uh, the essential features of statistical analysis and some kind of foundational Supreme Court cases. Um, so the point of statistical evidence is to kind of overcome evidentiary hurdles and get the matter to a court and a jury. And so there's typically an analysis, there's gonna be three features of the analysis. The first is practical, practical significance, where you wanna demonstrate that the discrimination is kind of big and serious, um, and the disparity is big. Uh, there's uh, statistical evidence is, ideally shows that uh, legitimate non-discriminatory factors don't explain the pattern that we're seeing. And then finally, there's statistical significance which is supposed to demonstrate that the pattern we see is more than just randomness. So I'm going to go through some examples of, um, of cases, some artificial and some, and some from the real world, and kind of point out these three elements, but kind of focus on statistical significance. Um, not because it's the most important, but because I think it's the kind of uh, least understood and kind of hardest to learn on your own. Um, so, let, so let's start with the artificial example, but the kind of a typical one. Um, Suppose you um, have a small kind of mystery shopper investigation with only a few tests, testers, maybe five in each group. Well, so practical significance occurs if the groups were treated very differently. Um, if this test is well designed so that we think that the testers are all similarly situated, so that the only difference between the two groups is a protected class, then we can roll out legitimate non-discriminatory factors. 
But even if we do that, we still need to know, could this have occurred by chance? Um, or really, you know, is five, kind of the question here is really, is a sample of five pairs big enough to support strong conclusions? And I've sat in on conference calls where people kind of hand wave this question and said, oh, I mean, you know, we have this tester study, there's only three test, tests or five tests, you know, is that big enough? You know, and the answer is you should, you know, ask the statistician um, and do a statistical test, and and which is exactly what a statistical test will tell you is, is the sample big enough? So a real a real example um, is the a recent uh, redlining complaint from DOJ. And so let me read out the kind of core of the statistical analysis. DOJ says the bank's peer lenders generated applications from majority Black and Hispanic areas at more than 2.5 times the rate of the bank of Cadence Bank. And these disparities are statistically significant. So they're making, they're pointing out all these features of the analysis. So in this, this paragraph, they're saying there's practical significance, the rate was 2.5 times higher. Um, they're doing a comparison to peer lenders, and that comparison is supposed to rule out legitimate non-discriminatory factors. Um, and they're doing statistical testing. They're saying the disparities are, are, are statistical significance. So there's this magic phrase. Um, and they do explain what that means by saying it's uh, unlikely to be caused by chance, is what statistical significance means. Um, so that's a common formulation, but it's a little vague. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I also wanted to put up the American Statistical Association's kind of informal definition of p-values, which is basically answering the same question about statistical significance. Um, I don't want to go through it except to point out that, it, that it's pretty hysterical that they call this informal. Um, but, but the point here is that um, unlikely to be caused by chance is kind of a, some tries to sum up um, in simple terms what's really a much more complex com um, concept. So two of the key uh, Supreme Court decisions that kind of still today affect how uh, statistical evidence is viewed by the courts are Castaneda and Hazelwood. Um, so Castaneda is the least important, but it, legally, but it's probably more important in terms of the statistics. So this was a jury um, selection case, discrimination and jury selection. And the background is that uh, there was selection included testing for jury eligibility, which is required citizenship, being of sound mind and good moral character, and so on, um, which potentially were legitimate um, uh, non-discriminatory justifications for any differences seen. A selection was by jury commissioners who had kind of wide, wide discretion to choose to choose the jury. Um, probably they used something like they used tax rolls or church membership lists or acquaintances. There wasn't any evidence in this case of what they did, but that's typically how the system worked and still works in some places. Um, and the court found statistical disparities. And so this was the first case really where a uh, statistical test was discussed in depth and found to be dispositive of a prima facie case. I mean, there's certainly many, many cases before this that use statistics, that use data. And there's a few tests, a few cases even that use statistical tests, but this is the first one where the statistical test really mattered. So this is the statistical test. Um, it's very simple data set. There's 870 grand jurors were selected from a county with a population that was 79% Mexican-American and 39% of those selected were Mexican-American. And so given these facts and assuming selection was random, the Supreme Court calculated that the probability of choosing 39% uh, Mexican-Americans uh, is one in 10 to the 140th power. They don't spell out what that means, um, but that means, but I spelled it out. It means 0 0.000, 139 zeros followed by a one. So it's much less than one in a billion, much less than one in a trillion. It's a tiny probability. So going over these, these three essential features for, in Castaneda. So there's practical significance. There's this big disparity, 40 percentage points. The non-discriminatory factors, they didn't discuss a lot, but to, to, to some extent, they, they mentioned them. So the eligibility test is potentially non-discriminatory explanation, um, but, but probably it applied at a later stage on this, select, this selection that they're testing. They kind of call people into the, into the courthouse and only then uh, tested their eligibility. Um, the other reason the Supreme Court didn't focus much on this is because there wasn't much evidence um, offered. And they did do a kind of limited attempts to look at this. They, they tried to, to um, looking at instead of the full population, they tried to have proxies for the eligible population. Um, 
And so, but the key thing is, of course, statistical significance is probability less than one in, as one in a zillion, um, way less than the kind of conventional cutoff, which is one in 20 or 5%, or one in 100 or 1%, 1 which is also a common cutoff. Um, so it's kind of a basic requirement. Um, and it's worth thinking about kind of what the, the test they're doing is. So they're calculating probabilities as if the jurors were drawn randomly from the general population, which is a little bit of a funny thing to do, considering that no one claimed that they were drawn randomly. You know, everyone agreed that there were eligibility standards and everyone agreed there's no population list to, to draw from. Uh, they're drawn from something different. So I think that um, it's statistical significance is kind of a minimum standard or a threshold. Um, it tells us whether there's, there's enough data to draw conclusions. Um, it kind of tells us whether this difference is real in some sense. Um, doesn't tell us whether the difference is big, but it tells you whether there really there is a difference at all. At all. Um, and it rules out at least something. It rules out, you know, a naive model with kind of naive model with that a perfect fairness where things are are um, jurors are selected randomly. Um, but so, which is you know, a threat, um, a important thing to do, uh, but doesn't rule in anything in particular. So. I think a way to kind of try to understand this idea that statistical significance measures whether we have enough data is to think about kind of when we have very little data. So here's an artificial example where I'm thinking about a situation where 25% um, of applicants to a job um, or I guess to, or to a public housing um, are women and none are hired. Um, so it's intuitive that if you just have a small number of hires, you're gonna, there's not much evidence of anything. So with only one or two hires, uh, there's no chance that you're going to get 25% uh, of the hires being women. It's just impossible. Um, and so presumably you have, to, you have to do, there has to be more than two and maybe a lot more than two before you can say that this disparity uh, is due to chance. So how many, how many kind of people, times do they have to go through the hiring process, uh, hire a man? Um, how many times does that have to happen in a row before you say it's statistically significant? Um, and the answer is, um, 11. So if they hire 11, given these um, facts, if they hire 11 men in a row, the odds of that happening, um, if they were hiring um, men and women at the same rate as they are in the application pool, um, is 4%. So it's less than this 5% of threshold that's common. Um, so I don't know if that's a big number or a small number. Um, I guess I see it as one thing this tells us is that, you know, even with the data set of 11, we can do a good, and we have a good analysis. Um, it's also, it's worth noting though, that if this, um, that the defense expert would look at this data and say, well, it's not a sample of 11. They would say, really, this should be split up into two groups or three groups because there are different hiring managers or there are different positions or there are different days of the week or something. Um, and so often the kind of battle of experts is over how big is the sample size that we should be conducting the statistical tests on. And the defense experts always want to say, you know, we need to, to, to do a number of tests on tiny little, whole large number of tiny little groups and say that they're all statistically significant, even though together they would be statistically significant. And then finally, um, I want to talk a little about the Hazelwood case, which is really very, a very important case. If you look at, say, the DOJ Title VI handbook, it kind of goes into considerable length talking about this. Um, so Hazelwood was a case involving um, uh, employment discrimination and hiring teachers in St. Louis. Um, and so over a three-year period, about 4% of the teachers hired were Black at, in Hazelwood. Uh, whereas the county population, in the county population, 15% of the teachers were Black. Uh, so that's presumably a proxy for the potential application pool. Um, so in this case, and Castaneda, the Supreme Court said, well, the test is the two or three standard deviations test. And that here they calculated that the difference between 4% and 15%, given the number of hires they made, um, was different by more than six standard deviations. Um, and so that, um, that two or three standard deviations test is a little bit of a funny thing to a social scientist. Two, two standard deviations makes a lot of sense. That corresponds to 5%, this common, this common threshold. Three standard deviations is really not something that statisticians really look at 
very often. And that, but that corresponds to less than 0.3% for what it's worth. Um, but the other thing I wanted to point out is that they have these kind of nice formulations of kind of uh, what what this what a statistical test means. They're saying that if if the if the, the statistical test undercuts the hypothesis that the decision was were being made randomly with respect to race, so that's their version of um, not due to chance. Um, or they say the hypothesis that teachers were hired without regard to race is suspect. So what, what's nice about this, from my point of view, is that they're kind of saying, telling you that this statistical test is kind of a rule of thumb. It sounds very um, scientific and precise, and to some extent it is, but ultimately the decision is kind of a yes, no decision. And we're saying, you know, a social scientist would consider this um, evidence against the null hypothesis that, that everything was fair. Um, so the Supreme Court, what they say they're doing is following Castaneda, which is again, a little bit of a funny thing. Um, so in Castaneda, they talked about choosing jurors randomly with respect to race. And so I guess the analogy here would be they're kind of testing whether Hazelwood hired teachers by choosing a random sample from the county population of teachers. And that's what their statistical test is. Um, that's kind of a not very plausible way of hiring. No one, certainly no one believes that, everyone is pretty sure that this, the school district was not doing that. But still it's, it's worth, presumably worth ruling out this kind of um, implausible uh, counterfactual as a threshold. Um, the strongest justification I can come up with for this statistical test here is to think about the racial distribution of the county as being a proxy for the racial distribution of applicants. And supposing that the racial distribution of applicants was 15% black and 4% were hired, um, then that would be, then you could calculate this test in exactly the same way as, as in the first uh, interpretation. Um, so it's a somewhat more plausible counterfactual, I think. Not, I don't think what the Supreme Court was saying in this case, um, but it's clearly an approximation. It's, you know, we're kind of doing a test to rule out this kind of idealized, completely fair hiring process. So everyone is frozen. I'm guessing no one, uh, I, I can't tell. Maybe someone can tell me if I'm if I'm still being heard because I can't advance. Okay. We can, can, yeah, we can still hear you. All right. Well, I can't advance the slide, but I'm coming to the I'll just to the conclusion. Um uh so we talked, I talked about the three. Um oh here we go. Um three essential features of statistical analysis. I've been trying not to call them elements of statistical analysis, because they're not elements in the way that they're elements of a prima facie case. So the courts have not said that any of these are really required, but at the same time, they kind of all are required, are pretty close. Um, so if you do have a systemic case or a disparate impact case or a pattern and practice case, almost always there'll be statistics and almost always they'll have these three features. They'll talk about practical significance and if it's a bigger disparity, this case is stronger. Uh, they'll try to rule out non-discriminatory factors. They probably probably can't rule them all out um, because you typically don't have you know data on everything. But the more you can rule out, the stronger the case you have. Um, and then there's statistical significance, which is just a kind of yes, no. But if you can pass the statistical significance test, and um, then you have a stronger case. Um, so we're, we're ruling out something kind of. Um, naive, but, but we're meeting this minimal threshold. And um, again, when, when statistical evidence is presented, um, statistical testing is not you know, a legal requirement necessarily, but you know, it's very close to being a real requirement. So you know, consult your statistician or economist early and often. Um, let me hand it back uh, to uh, Afa. Thank you. Before you go, Scott, I do have a question for you with regards to whether or not you think that uh, it is possible to do enough tests to say that the tests are statistically significant. In other words, if you did five tests, would that be statistically significant? And all of them showed discrimination. Would that be statistically significant? Or is, is there some other benchmark or can't we use statistical significance at all in testing? Oh no, sure, you, def you definitely can. Um, I mean, I, I'm really, I think 
like you really see statistical testing and, and that formal statistical testing when in these kind of mystery shopper audits. Um, but it really makes, but you should, it makes complete sense because there's this real question, is the sample big enough? And this, and the question is answerable. Um, it's a little tricky um, to, to answer, but definitely you can do it and, and should be done more often, I think. Do you have any suggestions on the number of tests that would reach statistically significant, or does it depend upon um, individual circumstances regarding the housing provider and the size of the um, area that the housing provider serves? Oh, it's, it's really the size of the disparity that 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 matters. Uh, if you have a big disparity, that's probably going to that'll be statistically significant with a smaller number of tests. Thank you very much. That was really helpful. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to go through that. Um, and good news, we are still ahead of schedule. So uh, we still have about a half hour left of the webinar. I have several um, questions uh, that I have for people after hearing everybody's presentation. But before we move on to that, I want to encourage everyone to visit NAFTA's website, web page for, to register for upcoming events, hear about fair housing accomplishments are being made around the country, and how together we are working to end housing discrimination. Also, be sure to follow NAFTA on the LinkedIn where you can hear of upcoming NAFTA events and other fair housing news. And now I'm going to move on to things that have come up in the Q&A, as well as other uh, questions that I uh, have been thinking of as we've been moving through this. So one of the points that I wanted to make before we start with the formal questions is um, for Scott Chang and anybody who was asking, who was talking about standing. Um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to point out is that there is guidance from HUD that shows that for purposes of filing an administrative complaint under the Fair Housing Act, or substantially equivalent law, meaning for anybody who has a fair housing assistance program, it is sufficient for a fair housing organization to allege that the claim discriminatory acts frustrated the mission of the organization or caused the organization to divert its resources. In other words, the standing issue under HUD remains intact and has not been significantly changed as a result of the cases that have been filed. I just wanted to be sure that uh, that point had been made. Thank you, Sarah Pratt, for putting that in the chat. Uh, before now, I would I would like to go on to a couple of questions um, that came up either on um, the Q and A or things that I myself had questions about as we were going through all of this. And Ayelet, I'd like to start with you. I know when we were talking before this began, you had some ideas about um, some case examples that you thought would be helpful for people to talk about. Do you want to spend a few minutes explaining a case that you handled that you thought would be illustrative for the people who are participating? Sure. Um, one case that I know we at HUD and our colleagues at DOJ talk about a lot is the matter in Hesperia, California, involving a uh, nuisance ordinance. Um, that is an, a local ordinance that penalizes folks for um, calling 911 or otherwise being the victims of crimes um, and seeking emergency assistance. It's a case in which HUD issued both a letter of findings and a charge and DOJ reached a consent decree um, a little while ago. All of those documents are available on our various websites. And if you're interested in reading more, uh, go take a look there. Um, and I, I point it out because it's one of the it's a case that I think does a really great job of blending statistical evidence with other evidence. Um, and it shows that 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 both of those buckets of evidence need to come together to paint the full picture of what's going on. Um, so there's a lot of data in there about who was being harmed by this ordinance, um, as well as data showing that it was intended to target protected class groups. It, it was ostensibly targeted at renters. But in that area, renters, in effect, meant folks of certain um, racial and other groups. Um, and so there was some data there. But also there were statements, just coded 
pretty close to explicitly racist statements. Um, and th those came into play as well, um, along with, with other types of evidence. I'll give a shout out to Scott, who did the data work on that case when he was still at HUD. Um, and I think it's, it's a great case because it, it looks very, the facts were messy. When they came into HUD, the facts were pretty messy and it was sort of hard to tease out a theory of the case from it. But with all of that evidence and investigation and the data and the qualitative evidence as well, we were able to put together what I think is a really strong theory of the case um, and got some real relief for folks um, eventually once the Department of Justice um, was able to settle the matter. Thank you, Ayelet. Amy, there's a question in the chat um, about uh, an example of a case where you used um, st uh, uh, st statistics that showed a statistically significant difference. Um, I know Ayelet just talked about that a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could also um, talk about it from a fair housing organization's point of view. Yeah, so we've had a you know a few of those cases um, looking purely disparate impact. Of course, we've used uh, data in our lending cases, not necessarily arguing a disparate impact in those cases, more differential treatment. But where we've tried to use it from a disparate impact, and we've used data or statistics in our um, restrictive occupancy cases. You know, gathering um, data about the number of families that might be living in a particular um, apartment complex or census tract or the lack of families, right? When you have a restrictive occupancy standard, um, families not living in those areas despite families living in the areas around. Um, so we have used that in some of our filings that we have had on those cases. Also, we've recently filed some uh, tenant screening involving eviction expungement and the tenant screening companies continuing to deny even though the individual's record had been expunged. And we um, gathered data about uh, showing that black males had a significantly statistical higher number of incarcerations that was going to disproportionately then impact their ability to find housing. And we also pulled in some eviction data as well, making an eviction kind of argument as part of the Fair Housing Center case um, in that one as well. Thank you. Hugh, I'd like to um, ask you a question um, with regards to the case that you went through, the one that took place in New York. Um, one of the questions in the um, Q&A is, is it possible to name a group of persons such as everybody of Afro-Caribbean descent, or um, do you have to list the actual aggrieved parties? How did you handle that in the HASME case, and what would you recommend as a best practice? My usually go-to best practice is to seek uh, the advice of OGC on uh, on things like that because it's important to get these things right as much as possible at the very beginning. The Hasney uh, had individual uh, nine complainants that were brought, so uh, maybe 50, 60 uh, complaints arising from the nine. If it's a systemic a case, no, you don't have to have uh, individual uh, complainants you can uh, have a, a larger group and you should be naming the respondents as thoroughly and as accurately as possible. Individuals, you know, cast a wide uh, net, but I would also seek, it, it can be case specific. So I would definitely want to consult a, a council and maybe uh, I would like to, uh, I yeah, would answer something too here. Uh, I'll give a lawyer answer and say that um, it, everything always depends. Um, in general, good practice is to name the specific people you're naming, but just because someone isn't named as a complainant doesn't mean that HUD or the Department of Justice, if that's where it ends up, can't get relief for them anyways. Um, so often we'll have complainants who are named in our complaints, um, but then if we reach a settlement agreement, we'll have a, maybe a victim's fund or something to that effect where we will um, work hard to identify um, anyone else who was harmed, regardless of whether they were named. So that would be 
all folks affected of that protected class group, for example, um, in the matter that he, matter along the lines of what he was describing, um, and and we can try to get relief for them anyways, even if they weren't named. So name as many people as you can. It always helps to have people identified, even if they're not willing to be complainants, bringing them to the attention of HUD, um, even if they're just willing to be witnesses or just for help HUD get a sense of the, the scope of the issue, that's helpful. Um, but just because someone isn't named in a complaint doesn't mean that they are precluded from getting relief under any sort of settlement. I just want to add, uh, I like to think we have a lot of time because I didn't take a breath during my beginning <laughs> of the presentation. So when I got to the conciliation section, it was up on the slide, but I'll mention it now uh, coming on the heels. Uh, of what was just said, that it's very important in, in doing the relief that you do allocate money sufficiently for a fund that identifies the victim's fund. And, and obviously going hand in glove with that is, is finding an administrator. You know, we used a retired judge, you know, you vet some, uh, some people to make sure you've got someone who's going to really analyze the submitted claims and that there's large widespread notice. You know, that's often uh, a sticking point with respondents. They want to settle, but shh, we don't want anybody to actually know know about it, right? So that's an important thing too. So you can identify victims and parties at the back end, but make sure there's robust provisions uh, for notice. Scott, I'm gonna ask you to expand on that a little bit from the perspective of plaintiff's counsel when you're setting up a victim's fund. Um, do you have suggestions on how to do that? What are some of the issues that people should think about? I know that Hugh and Ayelet were talking about really large cases, but I know that there's also cases where, you know, it's a 100 unit housing building or a 50 unit building where some people may have been have moved out and you've lost track of them and yet you still want to get them compensation. How would you do that? Yeah, I think there are a couple of ways to do that. Um, I think if you can name them as a complainant or a plaintiff, it's probably always best because then you can be assured that they will get compensation. Um, you know, HUD and DOJ like regularly get victims fund as part of the resolution of their cases. It's also been used in private litigation, like pretty rarely. Um, but, you know, sometimes you can negotiate uh, a victim's fund as part of a settlement. Um, and then um, I think the other option in private litigation is to bring a class action um, in which um, you know you have a few class representatives who represent the claims of the class. You know that is also complicated, and the law has has gotten uh, more uh, difficult to meet. But that's another way of um, making sure that everybody that's been harmed by discrimination gets compensated. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, Scott Susson, I have a question for you, which is that you went through some pretty sophisticated um, uh, mathematical calculations in order to determine um, that there was a disparate impact and you explained all of that in the context of the cases that you used. Do you have a suggestion as to when in an investigation uh, an organization should start looking for a, statist a statistician or someone to help them with the statistical analysis? And as part of that, I'm wondering if you have any advice about where someone could find someone to help. Um, probably not very good advice. I mean, so I think the kind of statistical testing that I emphasize is, is comes very late um, in the process. I mean, I think very early in the process, a, a statistician or a social scientist is probably very helpful in setting up the analysis and kind of getting the analysis down to something like a two by two table of, you know, like approved, denied, you know, one protected class versus another. Um, and even, and really, I think if you can just getting it, you know, getting your investigation into a two by two table, if you can accomplish that, that is the hard thing to do. Um, and then sometime, you know, towards the end of the process, maybe you should do a statistical test. Um, and so I would, so anyway, I would, I would not underrate the difficulty of just setting things up and I would bring in, you know, an economist or somebody like that early to do that. 
Do you have any suggestion about the qualifications that someone should look for when looking for an expert in a case? Um, I don't, you know, so I'm a PhD economist. I think you should get people with PhDs in the social sciences. Um, that's, yeah, um, I mean, that's my view. <laughs> I can't disagree with you, having done some of these cases. Uh, Amy, I have a question for you about the way that you have set up your um, investigations, your uh, systemic work. What do you do when you have staff turnover in the midst of an investi a systemic investigation so that by the time you file <clears throat> or even get to conciliation or, or litigation, you have a different staff that's actually doing the work how, how do you deal with that i think one of the most important pieces of that is is discovery and it particularly as discovery over the years has turned more technical and computer-based where it's you know very important that you um do not delete email accounts for instance uh you can keep those email accounts active so you can go back and pull emails you might need or or um, some in some of our cases we've had to do just complete uploads rather than hand selecting out emails we had to do just some uploads related to that of course having an organized investigation management system that i talked about by having everybody put everything related to that investigation in one spot you're not then going to be impacted by staff turnover with somebody only having certain items on their machine or on their desktop our staff is discouraged from saving anything on desktops at all everything goes into a public drive that everybody has access to and of course you're not going to be impacted by staff turnover then on your diversion or timesheet keeping because that's going to be all already documented and preserved as part of that so in so many ways, it really is just traditional than staff turnover. Um, it isn't anything different than any other position turning over if you have kind of those methodologies and everything to protect the heart of the investigation and your methods in place. Thank you. I have a question that I'm hoping everyone will weigh in on, or at least most of you will weigh in on, and that has to do with a situation in which you receive a complaint um, and you find that the um, complaint, in this case, one of the things that was brought up is a request for reasonable accommodation. And the housing provider responds to that request the same way to everyone. Um, they're not doing anything differently, you know, based upon the type of, of request, but um, they're maybe not responding exactly to each person's reasonable accommodation request. Maybe they have, you know, one form of answer um, for someone who wants an, uh, an emotional support animal, another um, form answer for someone that asks for a modification. How do you go about investigating that to really try to uncover some of the systemic issues that are involved there? Um, we're talking about maybe some places, uh, Amy, where you had also talked about where maybe the provider has uh, a co complexes across several states. Um, let's let's start with HUD, um, either Hugh or Ayelet, if you want to leap in and give some um, investigation examples uh, before we, we move on to some of the other panelists. It, just so I understand, we're saying that they they have a, a different process for processing the accommodation depending on the request or the disability. Is that right? But every single request is, you know, a response of get us more information. We don't have enough information to process this. It may, you know, then have a fill in the blank that says we don't have enough information about your need for a emotional support animal. No okay, real response. So Right. So for initial steps, you want to identify if, in fact, this is running across different uh, authorities or different complexes. And, and certainly we're going for a, a pretty extensive request for information. So get ready to review a lot of uh, documents that may be coming in, including and of 
course, accommodations implicate HIPAA and, and some other considerations uh, too, but you're gonna wanna, uh, the request, and you're gonna wanna break down the nature of the request and, and really get insight into their process and then supplement that uh, the documentary evidence with interviews both with uh, tenants requesting it and with staff who is charged with processing. You wanna look under the hood, not just at, at the outcome and then see if you can identify a pattern. So that would be my, my starting point. Uh, I can add to that a little bit. And that would be to start, I'll plug HUD's guidance on all things. HUD has put out a lot of guidance on a lot of topics, including reasonable accommodations. Um, there's even specific guidance on assistance animals um, within that. And there's handbooks, there's guidebooks, there's memos. A lot of our stuff is out there is publicly available, though perhaps not as easily findable as it should be on HUD's website. Um, and so I would start there, take a look what should the housing provider be doing? What would you have them do differently? What would HUD have them do differently based on this guidance? Um, then drill down, find some really good examples of meritorious reasonable accommodation requests that were not handled as they should have been. Um, you can still make an allegation that there's a broad policy gone wrong here while also highlighting specific examples illustrating how that's gone wrong. So what I would look for in a case like that is this housing provider, top line headline, this housing provider has a policy of not treating these requests, reasonable accommodation requests um, with the individual attention that they need and not conducting any sort of interactive process. As seen, for example, in the following five instances, but there are many more, right? And then highlight exactly what went wrong there, what should have happened, what policy or general practice of the housing provider is leading it to these requests not being handled properly, and then use those examples to illust as illustrations of that. I would just add, as in often the case, the rubber meets the road on the difference between the policy as written down and, and the practice. And I know Ayelet is, is talking about policy in terms of practice synonymously, but that's where you wanna look. You know, they may have the veneer of a really reasonable, reasonable accommodation and re, you know, responsive policy. And then when you look under the actual request and, and, and look at it, they, they don't. Q knows me well. Um, I get tired saying policy and practice all the time, policy and practice. But you can bring a case on either or both. And I think it was on one of my slides when you're drilling down and pinning down that precise cause of your problem, is the cause the policy as written? Everyone's enforcing the policy as it was designed, but the way it was designed is the problem. Or is the policy on paper fine, but something about implementation, how it's being applied is what's causing your problem. And to the extent you can be really specific about that when you bring us complaints, maybe, maybe we can process them a, a little faster than sometimes we do. The only thing that I would add, uh, the our HUD folks um, summarize this, you know, just just so well. But uh, you know, reasonable accommodation, reasonable modification cases, of course, can be very individual. It's the uniqueness of everybody's individual disability. However, the systemic part of the case comes in establishing the pattern that consistently, um, in looking at it from a systemic point of view, that this is a consistent pattern by this housing provider on how they approach, whether it's an accommodation or modification. Scott Chang, what would you like to see if someone were to bring a case like this to you? What are some of the elements that you'd look at before deciding whether or not that was a case you wanted to file? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, I, I was just going to add to um, the great responses um, to your last question. It, it also seems like if that um, fair housing testing could be helpful in that situation. Um, and you might want to run like a number of tests that would show that 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 each of the testers in certain situations are getting the same response. So one thing I might look at is whether or not there's fair housing testing. Um, I'd also want to look at if are there individuals who have the same experience, um, and I might want uh, there to be additional testing or additional interviews that help establish the pattern or practice. 
Thank you, everyone. That was very helpful. Uh, I have a question um, because I know that this is something that comes up in a lot of jurisdictions um, where there are both private fair housing organizations and legal services organizations. And Hugh started talk us, to, uh, uh, us out talking about a case that was brought to him by Brooklyn Legal Services. And I'm wondering if you all could talk a little bit about um, where you see legal services organizations filling the gap, what should they be doing, what should they be looking at, understanding that legal services has a very different um, position than many fair housing organizations. They may have geographical limitations that are not the same as private fair housing organizations. They may have um, uh, income limitations that are not the same. Uh, most fair, uh, private fair housing groups do not have any um, uh, income limitations. How do you fit private fair housing organizations and legal services into the fair housing puzzle? Well, I'll, I'll jump in and say that our legal services partners in, in our state have been so critical in helping us find uh, victims of discrimination, just because of the nature of the, the calls they receive. And also for us, because we do not do landlord tenant work, where sometimes fair housing issues can come up as part of evictions or uh, repairs not being made, things like that, that we have gone at different times to our legal services partners to help us in finding victims uh, to be able to make a systemic case more of a case than with bona fides. Or even um, we had a class action case uh, where we were able to, to do that because legal services groups obviously are restricted on class actions as well. But we were able to come in and kind of fill that void uh, for them. So there's some just some powerful partnerships there when it comes to being able to find individuals who've been directly harmed. Thank you. And uh, the last question that I have, um, and then we'll have to end it, is uh, how do you make a systemic case when some of the people affected by the illegal practice have also violated maybe a landlord tenant agreement? The example in the Q&A is that you're trying to say that um, the landlord is going after more people of color for evictions than people who are white. Um, but in fact, some of the people who are people of color may have uh, not paid their rent. How do you make a, can you make a systemic um, case out of that? And that goes for reasonable accommodation cases. I know that when we, I've done reasonable accommodation cases, trying to look at a systemic issue and the other side keeps saying, yes, but this person didn't hand, didn't uh, submit the right paperwork and that person really isn't uh, disabled. Um, and yet we're trying to talk about the policy and not individuals. If you could just address that, anybody. I'll take a crack at it. I, I think that if you have a systemic case, like the more evidence that you have of the discriminatory policy or practice, the less the case depends on each individual. And so you can have some flawed individual plaintiffs, um, you know, who might have things um, that, you know, aren't perfect. But if you have great evidence of discrimination, either multiple complaints from uh, individuals about this, of the same type of discrimination or testing that shows a policy or practice, like the less important it is that the, each individual, you know, have a, a perfect record or a perfectly clean record if you can show that there is discrimination occurring. I might only add that, you know, complainants like all of us are not perfect people and people come, you know, it, it, not always with the cleanest of hands. And if you pull back, as, as Scott said, to a, you know, the view from 30,000, you're going to get a pattern where as any in like lending cases, you know, often respondents will be able to point to something in the file. But I would also add a really close examination of the file may reveal that disparate treatment, right? So there may be that something in the file 
uh, of the one tenant who is then getting evicted or getting not getting what they should have. And then you examine, really, you want to dig down. It's time consuming. But, you know, very often you're going to find that the same thing exists in another tenant's file, but was overlooked or was explained or they were given, you know, a lending case, given a chance to cure or, or additional help. So, you know, sometimes the disparate treatment can be identified really at the micro level. And also when you pull back, you can see then that in fact, it is systemic in nature. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate everyone who was on here today. That's all of the time that we have. Even though we, uh, our speakers took less time in their presentations than we originally thought, um, I think that uh, this last piece of Q&A was really helpful for a lot of people to be able to uh, answer some specific questions. For those of you who ask questions in the Q&A that we didn't get to, I apologize. I refer you to the National Fair Housing uh, Training Academy's website for upcoming events and trainings, as well as for some of the um, recordings and materials that have been used in previous trainings. In particular, there have been trainings on things like how to litigate a fair housing case um, for people who want to work with private fair housing organizations to litigate cases. And I'm hoping that um, you, don't, you will find those helpful uh, and uh, for use as you go forward. Please be on the lookout for a survey, which will pop up when this training ends. The survey will allow you to provide feedback on today's event, and your feedback is critical because we want to be able to provide exactly um, the trainings that are most uh, needed for uh, fair housing people across the country. I also want to um, uh, thank all of NAFTA's staff and the people who work with them um, for all their work behind the scenes and helping us prepare for this. Uh, obviously, we couldn't have done it without you. And we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, NAFTA forum. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.